Can everyone please take your seats? We're about to start in a minute. <laughs> Would you be there a break in between the two? So, uh, I don't. We're struggling with the resolution on this one. It's not. Uh, it's is not it, is settling there a break down. Talks, we can I can do. We can do a short break if you yeah. want to. Or do you try it. like? Could we maybe? Alternatively, over to his computer or, or you email it to me and I'll yeah. just share it. Sure. Yeah. Have you got PowerPoint installed? Uh, I, I can do it in Google Docs. If you import the Google Docs, I'll do it from Google Docs. Yeah, Google Docs. Okay. yeah, yeah Google. because Google Docs takes. Still not picking it up. Has it detected it? That's annoying. It is annoying. Is it the cable? Because we did try another cable. Disappearing again. No, I think we can start that thing. That's going to take oh. half a minute, roughly. Okay. Um, so just tell them to talk amongst each other if you've got right. Okay, no, no, it's, uh... Is it just confused because of the resolution? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go for it and restart it. Yeah, yeah, go for yeah. it. Plug in. Yeah, plug it back in. I'm not sure what is showing the. Is it buffering the previous one? Yeah. No, it's not, it's not picking up the signal from HDMI at all. Oh, ah, okay. So this one just needs to come back online. And then Sorry. Which bird was that one? This is the cor <laughs> correct one. Okay, so, so it's. Uh, oh, uh -huh. here we go. It's online. Let's well. See. No, but here it looks like it's just about to show yeah. it because of the resolution changes. Yeah. Plug it back in, sometimes it works. Yeah. Because it needs a fresh yeah. fresh sync from HDMI. Oh, I think it's the, the one behind the TV. Can we reboot them as well? Yeah. I think we yeah, need to Yeah, because it keeps showing the uh, uh, Dan's laptop for whatever yeah. reason. Thank you. 
Okay, it still says booting. Okay, okay. perfect. Okay. Let's give it, give it a moment. It's green, so it should be, hopefully. We can unplug and plug it back in. Okay. If this doesn't work, I suggest we just plug your laptop directly into one TV and then we can make sure that um, we zoom out on the camera so that we capture you in the screen. And uh, I think Uh, okay, well, apologies for a bit of uh, technical problems, but uh, we do have one screen uh, up and running. And uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to uh, OWASP London Chapter Meetup. Um, uh, we are live streaming right now on YouTube, so uh, people watching us online on YouTube. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are today, of course, at this wonderful venue at Monzo, and thanks very much to Monzo for hosting us tonight. Um, if case you don't know who I am, my name is Sam Stepanian. I'm one of us, one of the chapter leaders. We have Andre here. Andre, do you want to wave? Yeah, there's Andre. And Sharif, unfortunately, is unwell, so he's stuck with flu at home today. If you're going to tweet about this event tonight, please use our Twitter handle, which is OWASP London, and use uh, hashtag OWASP London for us. Um, how many people are here for the first time? With a show of hands. Oh, quite a few. Oh, my God. So. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm glad you all found this event. In case, if you want to make sure you don't, you don't miss the next event, because this one was sold out very quickly, as you can see that people sat all over the place now. So how you can make sure you don't miss the next event, you can sign up to our mailing list, which is available as a link on our uh, webpage, owas.org slash London. You can follow us on Twitter, OWASP London, like us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page called OWASP London. Uh, we also meet up. OWASP London, you can watch us on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, Eventbrite, basically you can find OWASP London chapter everywhere. Also for developers, we do have our channel called chapter-london on OWASP Slack. If you need an invite to OWASP Slack, please come and see me, because one of the great things about OWASP Slack is apart from the fact that you can talk to the community and collaborate on various uh, application security tokens, uh, the topics, we do have a jobs channel, so it might help you with your next career move. So um, quick agenda for tonight. I'm just going to uh, update everyone on the news at OWASP. Then we're going to have um, our guest speaker, Mike Andrews, talk to us about the need for data security. Um, if you uh, looked at this event when we announced that we were supposed to have Sal Kimmick talking to us about open source security telemetry. Unfortunately, due to work commitments, she's in Amsterdam tonight, but we hope she will be able to join us and present here next time. Uh, so um, uh, Sal sent a fantastic substitute, Dan Kong, who's going to talk to us about <laughs> threat modeling and open source. Then we're going to have a uh, break session, Q&A, and then have a break. And then we're going to have a team talking about um, synthetic identities and uh, deep fakes and how cyber criminals can basically steal your money, pretending to be you. And then uh, after Q&A, we're all going to the pub. And I will show you which pub we're going to in a minute. Right, let's say I'm going to play this video, and hopefully the sound will work through my internal speakers. Or oh, maybe not. 
Uh, if not, uh, let me just quickly check on the sound, internal speakers, uh, because this is the video which tells you about OWASP. a nonprofit that stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. OWASP is a community of developers, technologists, and evangelists improving the security of software through tools and resources. OWASP has 100 plus active projects and new project applications are submitted weekly. Projects are open source and are built by our community of volunteers, people just like you. Community and networking. There are hundreds of local chapters worldwide and thousands of members. Meetings are free and open to everyone. They include training, talks, and networking opportunities. Education and training. OWASP hosts many events each year. They are a great way to improve your skills, build your professional network, and to learn about new trends in the industry. One of the many ways you can get involved is to become a member. The membership benefits include discounts for events and trainings, your own OWASP email address and Google Workspace access, a vote in our OWASP global board elections, and recently OWASP added a brand new member benefit, access to hands-on application security training through the OWASP Secure Flag open platform. Join us and become a member today. Okay, excellent. Hope that worked. And uh, obviously, at the beginning of this video, uh, you were told that OWASP stands for Open Web Application Security Project, but I do have a big announcement to make. So uh, on February 15th, the OWASP Global Board has voted for the letter W in OWASP acronym to change its meaning from web to worldwide, because OWASP is about helping everyone to secure their software, not just, uh, not just web apps. So all applications, mobile, API, cloud, IoT, even thick, uh, thick client apps. So we are now open worldwide. So that's a bit of a change. Member benefits, of course, you see in Secure Flag uh, platform. Uh, there's also uh, security journey training. There are also more benefits coming soon as well. So if you become a member, then uh, you will be able to access these uh, platforms for free and get free training. So we do have a OWASP membership portal. If you are a member, you can just go to members.owas.org from which you can access links to all this training. She includes application security Phoenix platform and Phoenix security. CEO founder uh, Francesco just over there yeah is waving his hand so if you want to come and talk to him about uh, all the uh, uh, access to application security and cloud security posture platform uh, community edition for all us members yeah he's the man to talk about this so all us membership uh, costs 50 US dollars per year so that's about three pounds 48 per month so probably one coffee a month um, judging uh, from the best exchange rate at the moment uh, students do get a discount so it's only 20 uh, US dollars per, per year and there's also corporate supporter accounts available so if you want to become a member you just visit us.org slash membership um, there of course you've seen all the benefits of membership in the video but there's one extra benefit that if you become a member recently come and talk to me because i've got this exclusive OWASP member laptop sticker that i can give you all right and uh, a lot of people like these stickers and no one else no other OWASP chapter in the world has them because i got the exclusive stash and these are the last batch and speaking of stickers, I'm going to do something tonight which we haven't done before. I'm going to give out a digital sticker or proof of attendance NFT to everyone who is here. If you have a crypto wallet, it can be sent straight to it. If you just have an email address, you can um, request it as well. The idea of POAPs is basically it's like a digital sticker, a digital memento. They're only valid tonight, so they're only valid for one day because they're only supposed to be uh, owned by people who attended the event and you can prove to anyone because the proof of your attendance is on the blockchain and you can see that there's a transfer of this NFT little sticker from OWASP London to your uh, crypto wallet. So come and speak to me because I, I have a little kiosk QR thingy which will uh, give away this uh, digital stickers. Um, so there are a lot of um, uh, supporters and vendors uh, which support OWASP, we're vendor neutral, but of course we're supported by vendors. If you would like to um, see your logo on OWASP uh, 
pages and support us, please do come and speak to us. Uh, OWASP London is blessed because we have quite a few um, companies who are supporting our chapter directly. I want like to say big thank you to all of them, and particularly to R2C and SEMGREP. I think Samu is here. Sam, can you wave? Yeah, yeah, she's right at the end. So thank you very much. So SEMGREP became the latest sponsor literally two days ago. So uh, they're also sponsoring OWASP London. If you would like to see your logo here, please come and talk to me. Um, also, big thank you to all companies who hosted our meetings before. And of course, can we give a big round of applause for Monzo for hosting us tonight? So we have Harriet and Vlad. Uh, uh, Harriet and Vlad, can I please ask you to come and say a couple of words? So Harriet is the technical recruiter at Monzo, and Vlad is the senior engineering manager in cybersecurity here. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, just a few housekeeping from my side um, and then I'll pass over to Vlad. Toilets are that way, um, fire exits are also that, that way. Um, if you want to help yourself there is some t-shirts on the back and please do not take any alcohol outside of the premise and I'll just hand over to Vlad for the rest. Thank you. Uh, just a few couple of words to say here. Uh, obviously, I'm Vlad, I'm an engineer manager in our security collective. Uh, we do we take security very seriously and very proud to have OWASP here with us today. Thank you all for attending. We also want to mention that we are hiring, although not all the roles may be available on our site. Uh, please get in touch with anybody with a Monzo shirt or we have a tech hiring at monzo.com. Also, uh, I'm available on LinkedIn. Please feel free to get in touch. In particular, we are hiring for our red team. We are hiring an engineering manager. We are hiring for DevSecOps, and there will be more roles coming out shortly. Thank you all. Excellent, thank you very much, Vlad. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for hosting. Okay, very quickly, if you want to get an OWAS branded merch, we have a merch store, owas.org slash store. That's where you can get branded stuff. Uh, speaking of conferences, there was a great OWAS Global AppSec Dublin conference we just ended a couple of weeks ago. But I am very pleased to say that all the video recordings of all the talks from that conference are now available on YouTube, so on OWAS Global YouTube. There are lots of absolutely amazing talks. Go and check them all out, please. And another big announcement that the next Next big uh, was Global AppSec conference is going to be in USA, in Washington, D.C., from October 30th. Anyone here from a company would like to sponsor? Uh, sponsorship packages are now available. And actually, Call for Papers was open and closed. It's now reopened. So if you'd like to speak at that conference, uh, Call for Papers is going to be open until 5th of March. So please go to dcglobalappsec.org and click on Submit Your Talk. Um, very quickly about OWASP projects, we have over 250 projects in OWASP Arsenal. One of the latest projects is called OWASP Top 10 CI CD Security Risks. So those of you in DevSecOps, I heard about the Vlad is our DevSecOps. What are the DevSecOps risks, CI CD Security Risks? So we do have Top 10. It is, of course, a brand new project, so collaborations are welcome. There's one more project I would like to mention, which is not yet on the slides. It's not yet ready. It is uh, OWASP No Code or Low Code Top 10. So uh, a lot of new systems, they're all no-code, low-code. So there will be a, um, a meetup of this project, uh, I think in a couple of days' time. Please do check meetup.com. It is going to be virtual. So if you'd like to contribute to anything about low-code, no-code security, you can do this. Quick announcement about Capture the Flag. We run Capture the Flag tournaments every year. And this year, hopefully, we're going to have one on 29th of March. So please save this date. It's a provisional date. You can hack your way to fantastic prizes that you can see on the screen. We've been doing this for seven years, and we aim to continue. And again, if you represent a vendor company uh, who would like to donate a prize, which can be Anything starting from a drone, a Nintendo console, uh, headphones, or maybe a bottle of whiskey. Someone donated a bottle of whiskey and that was very well received. Please do come and speak to us. Uh, very quickly about questions today, because there are people watching online and uh, also people in, in the audience. It's going to be very difficult to run around with a microphone to collect the questions. If you go to slide.do slash OWASP, you will be able to submit your question online. So that is a very important thing to say. And now I'm going to hand over to uh, Mike Andrews. So Mike is an industry veteran. He used to run a lot of things, including uh, cybersecurity for Microsoft for Bing, who uses Bing search engine, so <laughs> we, we have the guy who used to run it. And uh, Mike, uh, can you please come and set up your 
screen. And in the meantime, I will say a few more words about you. So uh, Mike is currently the head of engineering and product uh, um, at Open Raven. So uh, his roles previously included engineering manager for Microsoft Azure. He's also co-founder of Azure SRE team. Any SREs in the house? He was also director of engineering for Microsoft strategic engagement team. Of course, uh, uh, being security manager in previous life, he was an architect at McAfee and consultant at Foundstone. That's going back a few years. So Mike has a PhD in computer science from University of Kent, even though I believe he's a resident in California at the moment. And he's an assistant professor at Florida Institute of Technology. And the fun fact about Mike, back in the 90s, he was a roadie for mega rock bands. It's all yours now, Mike. Wow. You did your research, Sam. Um, I don't know how I can uh, compare with after I've been bigged up like that. But anyway, this is a lightning talk, so um, I'm going to keep it short. And um, I'm supposed to be like the warm up for the other, for the other um, speakers that are coming. So I'll do my best to make this fun and interesting. So the need for data security. People today are bombarded with alerts and things that they must do. So patch levels. CVE notifications, SIM warnings, SAST issues, compliance deficiencies, the list goes on, on and on and on. Why are we still chasing them? Chasing all of them. It's because we've always done so. There's a prioritization of these alerts, high, medium, low, but they're still usually treated exactly the same. A high is a high, you know, we're gonna get to it now. A medium, maybe someday. A low, we're never going to get to it. But it's the proverbial tail wagging the dog. Um, the horse before the cart. No one should really care about these events. They are mostly around their, 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 um, uh, their priorities. And I think you know one of the guys from one of the guys from your group, um, uh, Dan Cuthbert, did an analysis on CVEs and the high CVEs and the number they end up getting fixed and the number that actually you know end up uh, end up being used for breaches, and it's a it's a staggeringly low amount. So why are we chasing them? Why, whenever we get a high CV, do we must go and patch it like right now? What are we doing? So. If I look at this, this happens, you know, all the time. We run around chasing, you know, log, how many people are chasing around log4j vulnerabilities around their networks and around their software, like, all the time. But again, no one really cares. It's not about the vulnerability of the host. Um, it's about the data, as we see every week. There's kind of these kind of things that happen in the tech news that I see all the time. I particularly like the one in the middle. Guardian staff forced to work out a former brewery after ransomware attack. Um, I'm not sure that's cut such a bad thing, but anyway, for the staff. So anyway, this hasn't always been so. Um, why is that? Because as Willie Sutton says, that's where the money is. There's only really three things of value in a computer system. There's the compute, there's the network, and there's the data. There used to be money in all of these, in, 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 in these strings. Like when you get a foothold into a system, you could use their compute for bit mining, for spam. You could use the network for DDoS attacks and things like that. Um, that's not necessarily the case anymore. Um, there's a lot of mitigations for them things in place. And the prices for criminals to use them kind of things have dropped. So like, you know, Bitcoin prices dropped. Why are you mining for it now? Um, the price for a DDoS, if you've got lots and lots of thousands of servers, right? The price of that was dropped. So they go for where the money is. Get some good data, and there's money in them hills. Times have changed, but we haven't. We're still doing the same things, even as computing is going through one of the biggest changes that it's ever had, the move to the cloud. So I wondered why things are different now. Why haven't people pivoted towards data security and still doing the same things? There's a corollary between patch levels 
um, of servers and those of VMs or containers in the cloud. The same with firewalls and security, uh, security groups, the same with you know, ACLs and IAM. So I pondered, why is data security a bigger thing now than it used to be? So after time, I kind of realized it's because the systems of 10 years ago used to be very vertically integrated. There was a database, a middle tier server, and a front end, all neatly packaged. And there were lots of these. They were kind of stamped out across a corporate, a, a, a corporate landscape, um, mostly independent. Their sphere of influences and operations and controls were, um, were contained. It was very rare for systems to be talking to each other. It was very rare to have you know, systems that spread out like you know, across a network. Um, data neatly resided in very well-known and localized places. There was little cross-sharing of data. And if it was shared, it was generally through some commonly controlled central databases or NAS systems that were provisioned and managed by IT. Oh, no, sorry, not that IT, different IT. They had the keys to the kingdom, and if deemed worthy enough, and they blessed you with some you know, database somewhere or some extra storage, or maybe if you're really good, some extra or more uh, capable or better servers. But that's not what today's systems look like. They're built up from lots of collaborating microservices and software, and they're spread across many, many places. Some of them that you may own, some of them you don't. So take a quick look at that diagram. It's not a particularly complex one. It's just one that I pulled off the web. I've seen much more ones that are in more insane looking than that, and hell, I've architected them myself, unfortunately. But if you look closely at that, there's seven, counting seven data stores in that diagram. And that's not including where logs could go to, that's not including source code repos, that's not including documentation, etc. All of these provisioned and available with a few clicks of a credit card. So what if there's another way? The red pill to escape the constructs where we're chasing CVEs and patch levels, etc. Or the blue pill where we carry on doing the same. But who am I kidding, though? We end up taking both pills, somewhat like Neo being offered some MDMA in a rave and just snatching both of them, because that's the kind of people we are. Have you ever thought what would happen? Do you stay in the matrix or do you get flushed out? And that kind of bugs me. It's like, you know, what happens with a spinning top at the end of in uh, Inception? It's one of life's mysteries, and it bugs me, at least. So we're talking about data and having a data-centric approach to security. And I'm not talking about the crown jewels of data. We know where that is. It's locked up and it's guarded by people with funny hats. No, I'm talking about the rest of the data, the stuff that's out there um, that glues things together, you know, that keeps our software turning, the log files, right? the, um, the data lakes, the documentation, the backups, that S3 storage system that you know, Jack set up the other day that no one really knows why. It's because your data isn't where you think it is. It's not neatly in relational databases. It's not categorized. It's not backed up. It's dumped on the floor, unstructured, like a teenage boy's bedroom, at least until they want that T-shirt that Jacqueline down the road really likes. So, as an aside, you kind of like have to excuse my friend down there at the front. He's a friendly guy, he's got a really contagious laugh, but he's got this big chrome dome and he just insists on sitting at the front of every single presentation. So I considered photoshopping him out, but life's too short and um, I really don't care that much. But anyway, say hi to Benjamin. Say hi to Benjamin, come on. Hi Benjamin. No, he's not taking that much attention, probably like you guys at the back. Anyway, we have to realize that our software and systems are like mini factories. They're taking in raw resources and producing a refined output, but while they're doing so, they're producing this digital exhaust. And most of that is benign, logs, configuration, and data files. 
But as benign as they are, it's those things that end up getting corporations hacked. Or at least on the cover of the tech news every other week. There's some data leak, there's some ransom intrusion. Um, but just as much as you know, we all kind of love these high um, sophistication vulnerabilities, um, the ones you know, that are world ending and don't nearly happen as often as we think they are, it's the boring basics, the things that we have to keep up with. It's like running into Bigfoot on your morning jog around Hyde Park versus not looking, on the, not looking as you cross the road, as you cross Park Lane back to your swanky apartment. One of these things is going to kill us one day, and I think we know which one. Maybe Bigfoot may be hiding behind this tree at Speaker's Corner. I don't know, maybe he has uh, some strong views about you know, the policies of Sunday trading or something. But here's what I do know. There's AWS keys and secrets that are often found in GitHub repos. There's unreleased footage of uh, 3D, and there's unreleased footage and 3D resources from A title games on a public Slack channel. There's company sensitive data stored externally with anyone with a link. And there's personal private information open in an Elasticsearch server. Emails detailing company contracts, preferred pricing, and some probably not exactly commentary about the said customers, all sitting in an Azure blob store. And our old favorite, an open S3 bucket with nothing less than millions of passport data. No. <laughs> so what should we do? Well, the first thing is, is let's try to map out our data stores. So as Mr. Miyagi says, you can't fight if you can't see. Um, oh, I probably got that wrong. It was a bad guy, but whatever. And then what we do is we start annotating where them data stores with the different types of data and whereabouts it was found. Yes, it's a lot of work. There are tools out there to help this. No, I'm not going to pitch any on what their pros and cons are. I'm not doing that vendor thing up here. But with this info, when your SIM starts alerting, or your CSPM tools are starting to warn you that there's this public um, database that's out there, or this open bucket, or this is vulnerable system that is exposed to the internet, or your SAS system says that you, know, that you must fix this dependency for this critical SC, uh, um, CVE, and then someone goes and reaches for that emergency button, you know if they're protecting, or if the real thing that is at risk there is either cat GIFs or credit card data. And that should dictate your response, not whether it's a high CVE, not whether it's alert on your CSPM or something. What it is is the actual data that people are going for, because that's the thing of value. The thing of value isn't the CVE. It's the data that someone is going to get to from that. So you can use that, and you can use that to proactively filter and target the scope of all of these tools that are constantly chirping to just what's meaningful. So come on, I've got to stop talking and get to the real speakers. The point is, is let's not get distracted by the new and shiny. SBOM is a thing. It's probably needed, but not if you're walking around with your data exposed. So a quick takeaway, something that you can do now. We have a fetish for data. We hoard it but we don't use it as much. We don't really need it around. Most data just sits there like nuclear waste gathering. We've used it for powering our plant and then it just sits there. We've got to do something about it. Or maybe a better example is that cable that I've just used and I stuff away in that box because maybe I'm going to need it later some other day. Come on, I'm not the only one that does that, right? You guys do that too. So data has a half-life until it becomes no longer useful. 10 years for a passport, four years for a credit card, 30 days for a log file, maybe seconds for an exception or a memory dump. Until that time, data's after that time, data's just not useful anymore. And keeping it longer isn't necessary and it's just adding risk. We can't be golems. Craving the precious. Um, data is evil. It corrupts and it gets us into all kinds of problems. If we know where the vulnerable data is, 
how it's used, how it's useful, how it's protected, then we can manage it. That may be securing it, or it may be throwing it in Mount Doom to get rid of it. But we have to get them back to the Shire and we can live good, happy, simple lives once we can manage the data that we've got and we've got rid of the stuff that we don't need. It's not easy to do. But when I'm asked about data security and remediations, it's the most simple and straightforward one out there. Take out the trash. We end up becoming happy because it's less to manage. Our bosses are happy because it's less risk. Our accountants are happy because it costs less money. Jeff isn't happy because you aren't paying for them AWS storage that you're not going to use, but fuck that guy, he's got enough money. <laughs> and that's it. I'm Mike Andrews, I'm the head of engineering at Open Raven. You can get to me at these places, even at the bird site, well, it's still a thing. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, amazing talk. Uh, we have one question which came in from Slido. Um, the question is, should you also use vulnerability age to decide on fixed priority? And if so, how? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about the vulnerability age? The vulnerabilities can be sitting around forever, and if they're not you know, taken advantage of, they're not being taken advantage of. I have a strong belief, maybe it's the wrong one, but I think that it depends upon the data that it's a protecting. The things that are sitting out there, the brand new ones can get attacked straight away. The old ones can just be sitting there not being, not, not being used. Chasing around CVEs, chasing around vulnerabilities, just purely for what their score is or what their age is, it's just going to be a game that we're just never going to keep up with. So looking at the data and saying, OK, this system has this vulnerability. What data has it got or what data does it have access to should dictate whether I need to go and do something about that system. Didn't hear the question, sorry. Vulnerability data is still data that you have to protect. It can be. You have to be careful with it. If someone gets vulnerability data, it's like a footprint of where you have problems within your network. And so for sure, right? The vulnerability data is data itself, and you can say that that is valuable. But do you know where that vulnerability data is? I bet it's not just in that, you know, the tool that you're using and its, and, and its database. I bet as that tool is working, it's spewing log files all over the place. I bet that you know, as someone emails things around and got a report and drops it out somewhere, it's in them kind of places. It's not often the primary data that gets you hacked. It's the secondary data. It's the exhaust, the AWS key that's been left around that then someone goes and that someone goes and uses. And they're the things that's hard to find. And I think if you guys, if there's one thing I I, I want you to take away is to you know to have a look around and see where that extra data is, and how you can find it what you can do to protect it, and then just, you know, just, just know what's out there. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, sub. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, I mean, you've talked about lots of different data all over the organization. We do, and, and everyone does, and most of it we don't know. My question is, with all this data, do you have any suggestions on how you get about valuing it? Because not everything is the same value. We've got lots of assets, Data is just one of them. As you know, security people, we need to understand and look at the risk, how we value what data we've got, what are real assets and what are just things that we can get rid of. And I know that you said we, we should be deleting data. We don't. But mm -hmm. how do we delete the right data and not the wrong data? That is such a difficult question to, to answer generically because it, it, it entirely depends upon the company, the organisation you're working with. Like one of the people that we've worked with, right? They they end up they, they end up asking us, you know, to, to scan systems to go and find stuff that is a particular code word of a project because they don't want that released until when it when it needs to. Um, that wouldn't exist in any other organisation looking for that looking for that data. But it's critical for them that they don't leak this project. As soon as the project is 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 done. That's it. The same with financial data, right? The financial data of, you know, the, the, the data for the close of quarter has to be really protected well until it's released. After it's released, it becomes public, inform it becomes public information. 
The same with like documentation. One of the things that I found that is just, you know, <laughs> a lot of people just ignore is the documentation of a product. The documentation of a product that should be internal for customers only or should be, you know, for pre-release ends up getting put into, you know, some bucket or, as I've seen loads of times, it's on a, it, it's on a, like a readme.io site that you, you just need to know the URL and go and find, go and find it. It's really hard to say because it entirely depends upon your organization. A lot of the time is talk to your CEO, talk to your head of engineering and say, what data would you not want on the cover of the New York Times? That's what you go to first and then work down from there. So, uh, any more questions? Um, there was a question uh, online. Um, I think that's probably not for you, but for Vlad, <laughs> for the head of security, which is the Monzo destroy ID data after approval of pics and video. Because obviously, if ba online banks do verification, uh, asking you, I think you did have a slide where uh, with an ID, right? Mm -hmm. A picture of a passport, right? So, can you? Talk a bit. Uh, what are the dangers of keeping this data? Yeah, it's it, it's to do with joining data up for things. Like an ID, uh, an ID on its own may not be useful, but when you join it with financial information and stuff like that, all of a sudden then can be used for for, for fraud. Um, we've got another customer that is looking for VIN numbers. VIN numbers on their own are not a problem, but as soon as you start putting geographic data that's next to them, you then start tracking people in their cars, and that kind of like freaks people the hell out. So. Yeah, it depends, but you don't just look at data in isolation on its own in that one thing, right? Is it can be IDs of once you've once you've done stuff, and then the data age becomes a problem. Stale data, right? Data that's been put out there and not being read or written is just, as I said, adding risk. Um, so, you know, you look for that, and you look for how long it's been there, and how much it's been used, and how much it's been accessed, and then when it's not, try and get rid of it. Excellent. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, it's time for our next speaker, and the next speaker is Dan. And uh, I do have Dan's presentation here, so he doesn't need to plug in his laptop. So uh, Dan uh, is best known, this is actually how I met Dan, uh, through DJing, because you can find Dan DJing at, a lot of, uh, at the end of a lot of networking parties at the end of a lot of cybersecurity events. Uh, but obviously, when not DJing, Dan is also running marathons. I think you ran one two days ago. Half marathon. Half marathon. Half. Yeah, half, half marathon. But Dan is also currently a developer advocate on Sonotype. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Wow, it's quite a lot of people when you're up here. But um, yeah, thanks to Mike. Um, he said he felt like the warm-up act. I certainly feel like the guy that's kind of playing at 5 in the morning after the headliner after that talk. So. <laughs> We'll see how this goes, shall we? Right. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a developer advocate for Sony Insight. Um, I've worked as a developer for about 10 years, as well as kind of the DJing and the running and stuff. But um, kind of been interested in cybersecurity for just as long. Um, I've got postgrad certificate in it. I'm not an Australian rugby player. That's completely different Dan Con. He should change his name. He's three years younger than me. I had it first. Um, the slides will be available if you want to kind of link up afterwards. Those are all the links. Um, kind of want to start, oh, I've forgotten one thing, but that's all right, we'll go on with it. Um, I wanted to start with kind of my OWASP journey, because why well, am I here, right? I don't really do AppSec for a living. I did have a baseball cap from OWASP Dublin in my pocket, so I was going to do the rest of the talk. But yeah, how do you do, fellow AppSec kids? You know, that's how I feel at the moment, kind of standing here. Um, Started about 10 years ago, three months, well, nine years and three, three months ago, I got hacked. And um, that's the main reason I know about OWASP, because I was sat there not really knowing what to do, three months in and seeing a defacement of a website and um, having to kind of do instant response on the fly. Has anyone done instant response here? I'm guessing quite a lot of people, yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. And if you don't know what you're doing and you're trying to do instant response, it goes really badly. Um, so after that, which was quite some time, I found out, you know, I was in a position where kind of everybody above me didn't actually know what secure coding was either, because 10 years ago it wasn't really that well known about, um, rightly or wrongly. <laughs> um, so I found the OWASP top 10 and started thinking, well, how am I going to actually 
be a better developer, because it's kind of my job to, right? And that's kind of it. Wherever I've kind of worked, I've kind of wanted to try and bring in secure coding or, you know, in, use the OWASP's app as a vulnerability scanner or, you know, try to look at, you know, dependency management with, with dependency track. And, you know, over time, these, you know, you, you start, like, learning more and more and more. And, you know, over the, uh, you know, a decade, you, you tend to learn a little bit about it. So I feel a little bit more confident talking. Um, but the main reason I know a lot about OWASP is the beer farmers um, who, when lockdown happened, they did InfoSec Happy Hour. I think Sam spoke for definitely one of them. Um, and quite a few others. Um, so I think like, you know, where you have the thing where, um, you know, to raise a child, it takes a village. Well, to raise a security conscious developer, it takes Knapsack Village. And kind of these are the people that day in, day out, most of them have worked with, well, two of them I've worked with on a daily basis, and the rest of them have just been incredibly kind with their time, um, mentoring me, um, sometimes just giving great advice, um, you know, on multiple occasions. And so, yeah, let's say thanks. I know m many of them are OWASP members as well. So, what is threat modeling? Who doesn't know what threat modeling is in the room? Anyone? Cool, there are a few. Right, okay, so we'll go through. Very briefly, I uh, found this article, um, article, first paragraph on the OWASP uh, description of threat modeling, uh, Victoria Drake. Threat modeling works to identify, communicate, understand threats and mitigation within the context of protecting something value. Um, you know, so basically that's it. Well, that's all you're doing. You're trying to protect something. So as Mike was saying earlier, you know, you've got data. You know, that's actually probably the most valuable thing you need. Um, everything else, yeah, is, is still important. You've got to fix vulnerabilities. It's, you know, there's, well, we'll go on to that later. But, you know, on the most part, you want to protect data, you want to protect assets. Um, four main questions. Threat Modeling Manifesto came out a few years ago. Um, again, another OWASP thing. Um, four main questions you ask. What are we working on? What can go wrong with what we're working on? What are we going to do about it? And then at the end of it, did we do a good enough job? And if you didn't, let's go back to question one. Um, and yeah, you know, it's done with every, you know, uh, you know, as diverse a thought as possible. You know, everybody has different ways. You know, if you have actually people in the threat model that aren't just security engineers, you get very different set of knowledge around how all things work. You know, I, th I think... Um, Quite a few times I've done this, you know, we've, we've done threat modeling as a group and had, like, you know, somebody that's kind of new to de development and they'll bring out some really good insights into what a system does because they've just gone through a, a UD program or boot camp and they aren't really stuck in, you know, a, a way of working that they've been working in for like five or six years and kind of making excuses for things that are, oh, that's just the way it is, you know, so we don't really need to worry about that too much. Um, and yeah, security should be for everyone. So that was a bit of a ramble, wasn't it? So now we get on to what we're actually meant to be talking about. So um, modeling threats in the open source. So open source has got loads of threats. Um, you know, one, we consume loads of it. Um, Supply chain attacks seem to be increasing like, well, 742%. That's a huge increase. And even if you, what you build in the open source community is really secure, chances are you're pulling in something that, due to a transitive dependency, you're actually bringing in a vulnerability of some kind. Further to that, <laughs> there's legislation in the US, in the executive order, and also, hopefully, that it will change by the time it gets published, but the Cyber Resiliency Act, which is kind of making, well, suggesting that maybe open source people could be liable for, you know, what they build, you know, which we all know, normally the warranty on these things is as is, because it's doing a good job, right? It's helping people. So I think, you know, in some ways, if this legislation goes as is, we definitely need to think about these things. And what else is the problem with open source? Well, it's very difficult to model, because I think, um, again, you know, <laughs> I'd love that you're actually a start our talk, because it's like, oh, yeah, that. Um, so, um, you know, in, as you say, like traditional architectures, you know, you have like MVC models in software, you know, very well understood. Open source, you might one minute be in an MVC module, you might have your library pulled into some bigger library, you might have a Kubernetes cluster. You don't actually really know what your hardware is underneath. You just know that your product's being used. And how far 
do you kind of model around that? You can't, right? It's kind of a bit impossible to cater for every single use case that your product would, or not product, but you know, your project would be envisaged in. So on top of that, you know, yeah, so actually all through things. So how kind of, so what we did was uh, with one particular open source project, which is used in a uh, CI, CD kind of pipeline, um, they were trying to pass um, a CNCF graduation, and they got very far, and actually it's a very secure system. It's just that what they maybe had, you know, they had kind of not really identified everything really that they could have. So how do you find a way of trying to explain what, what threat modeling is, try and get people engaged, and, you know, have, you know, have, have them participate and also save a lot of time because it's people's spare time that they're doing this in, right? Well, tools. So what tools do we have? We have like the OWASP Threat Dragon. We have uh, PyTM. And we also have not an OWASP product, but it's the one we use, which is Fragile. Um, any one of these could have been used. Yeah, it wasn't, you know, it, it was literally trying to think of why we actually chose one. We wanted to have architecture dry style diagrams for the data flows, because that's where they you know, felt more comfortable. You know, as a developer, I am used to seeing an architecture diagram with a certain way, way it works. I found, personally, Threat Dragon didn't quite do that, but actually it's still very clear. It's a, it's a, it's a different way of doing it. It's actually, in some ways, very clear. It's just, for us to start, we kind of chose a different way. Um, we also wanted an update mechanism that felt comfortable for developers to use, um, which I think, you know, um, yeah, so we were looking at something that kind of could do with code. Um, and we wanted a data flow diagram to show what the data flowing and what level of risk then to each component you got based on where the flow went through. So we chose Fragile. Um, so why am I an OWASP? thing talking about fragile. Well, it's actually quite good. Um, a few years ago, Christian Schneider brought it out. Um, he I think he demoed it in uh, DEF CON. Um, it uses YAML to kind of model the architecture. And I think it's a really good use case for that. You know, it's highly updatable. It's very quick. Um, and you can also have the relative attacker attractiveness for each module, um, which allows you, once you see the percentages, you can then see the data flow. And it says, well, this needs looking at the way that you're connecting to the different elements is, you know, this, this is what you should uh, be looking at. So, you know, the higher the RAA in theory, the more interesting it is to compromise an asset. Um, it's written in Go. Um, it can basically be run on a command line as a REST server, docking container. Um, you yeah, know, it's very flexible. Um, so this is kind of what we ended up with. Um, I say, you know, you code with YAML, you have, um, you know, you put each of kind of these elements in. So here we have like a build time boundary. Within a boundary, you'll put the particular element. So here we have like a Git client. We have the build pipeline through GitHub Actions. Um, ooh, over here, we have, um, you know, like Kubernetes cluster within, um, the host, we also have you know, the Argo CD namespace and then the rough Kubernetes network, what we think people might use. I mean, it might not be that. It might be that we've made some huge assumptions, but you've got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and this is essentially it. This is what we've got at the moment. And it's taken a couple of months to get here. Um, we've been meeting kind of every couple of weeks. We say, right, what have we got? We have some risks. They are output as a PDF, along with this. Um, That's what we like about Threadjar is that this is kind of generated, self-generated from basically from the YAML. So we don't, we didn't draw any of this. This is all done like that. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. Um, what are the benefits? Well, because the data model is an image, you can kind of put it in a project, right? You can just stick it in there. Wouldn't it be really cool, like we've done this for one project and it's taken quite a lot of time. Wouldn't it be good to template this? Wouldn't it be good if 
or various organizations could kind of have like maybe a dot secure yeah, you have like a dot github folder i think for like license information what if there was a dot security folder just for open source projects where they could put their threat model in they could put you know their risk assessment they could put all their information that's with that project so the security conscious around us could actually say well well, okay, yeah, you've actually put some thought in it. Now, I don't think any of these would be perfect because it's the onus is on it's on developers that might not really even know anything about security. But at least it's a start of trying to get people to think about security a bit more than maybe what they are already. So then we look at that and we go, well, that's the kind of state of where we are at the moment. You know, are we doing a good enough job on Argo? Well. I have no idea. Hopefully, the you know, as for a wider community, there's a lot of you know, OWASP is one of kind of many organisations doing very similar things. Um, you know, I think the BCS are now getting involved in trying to. Uh, they have a very good uh, cybersecurity uh, chapter. Uh, NIST, obviously, NCSC doing very good work. Um, and I think like together we could actually, you know, with a lot of collaboration and um, allowing for these uh, threat models to be within uh, open source projects, you know, together we could actually make a real, real good start. Why is that? Well, oh, okay, I missed a slide, that's great. I've got to stop doing this. Right, what you should have seen there was a graph that said, well, what do we know actually can, can really benefit from developers? And one particular thing is code reviews are actually one of the, you know, from the OpenSSF scorecard uh, algorithm, we found that um, code reviews are actually incredibly useful as a way of um, stopping um, bugs, basically, and bad vulnerabilities. So, if you think of threat modeling as a security code review, you know, you're just asking the same questions, really. Have you, you know, instead of have you coded it correctly, it's, well, have you actually, you know, is this secure enough? Have you got TLS 1.3 there instead of 1.2? Are you, do you need to encrypt at rest? Or is, you know, what's your other solution, you know? So, and then having this kind of one-to-one -one or, you know, group-to-many kind of discussion, having a template for it allows people that are outside of application security to kind of start that. Now, some of you might think, well, that's not a good thing. We, we, wanna, we wanna meet people, actually. And I'm not saying that it's a substitute, but, I've worked in a place, I've worked in a few places in fact, where the application security team might be three or four people, and the development team's about 100, or 50, or an incredibly large amount of people that you're never gonna meet on a day-to-day -day basis, you're never gonna teach them one-to-one. -one. Well, you might do once every two years as it cycles as you go through each large company's project. And then by the time you got to the end one, you realize that you gotta do it all again because Time's moved on, things have changed. All of those things that you raised Jira tickets for are still there. <laughs> and I'm not saying that that's a developer's fault either. I'm saying, you know, a lot of the things, it's a, it's a mashup between security and productivity. It always has been, right? So, where do we go beyond this? Well, use templates to help raise the alarm and be able to, you know, essentially have, you know, start the discussion around what application security is. Use loads of tools to help. You know, I think that's why I started, right? Is to give free tools. Um, you know, there are many free ones. There's many open source ones, you know. Um, and, you know, that's right. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> I don't know why there was, sorry, I'm babbling. Um, so, more complex projects should have someone that's kind of application security trained to kind of help them through it as well. So I think there's also maybe a call to, for application security professionals to devote a little bit more time. I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room actually devotes loads of time, so I'm not like, you know, it's not a dig. It's just saying, you know, I think like when you have projects that are responsible for huge swathes of, you know, finance or, you know, different huge companies that we should probably pay attention to those a bit more. Um, and if you're not in security, everyone in the project should be questioning your open source projects. You know, is this what you expect? Run unit tests on, you know, so if, I think like some open source things I've used have been around text translation. 
to find, like from project to project, they just change. Well, why is that? Well, because the vote around what was good has now moved on, but you weren't part of that vote. So how do you know it's actually still useful for you? You know, run unit tests on your, in your run integration tests on your integrations. You know, know that it's actually is it safe? Are you are you satisfied? And if it's not, then you can contribute and make it better, right? So, I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, right, do we have any questions on threat modeling for Dan? Um, yeah, a couple. Uh, yeah, who in a, in a you know, moderate-sized company, who should do the threat modeling? Who, who should you bring in? I know you had as diverse a group as possible, but what functional roles do you think you need there? So, yeah, good question. I See, I used to think that it should be only people that have got kind of a knowledge of security for a really long time. And actually, I'm all for, as a way of sharing knowledge around a whole business, kind of allowing anybody that wants to kind of get involved and just say, you know, I'm not saying like it's a free for all, with, you know, with nobody with no knowledge should be in there. But, you know, we, we're always talking about sharing knowledge around different parts of the business or, you know, trying to explain why a password manager might be used or certain ones might not be used in recent times. You know, it's that you don't get that knowledge if you're not really going to take part in these things. And I think, that, you know, things like elevation of privilege games, stuff like that actually are a very good way of sharing that knowledge. You know, because if you, if you don't want to participate, you can at least sit and learn. Um, so I would say anyone, you know, down to... Uh, you know, any, anybody, not even tech, you know, outside of, you know, if somebody in the marketing team wants to join, great, let's bring them in, you know, and that way, that's how you make security better, in my opinion. Threat models for complex systems can be incredibly expensive to produce. Mm. You have some security people in the room, you have some senior engineers and architects, maybe your marketing person. So how do you know you've got the ROI on it? How do you know that you've done a good job? after spending a couple of hours, maybe even a couple of days, sitting in a room, how do you know that you've done a good job at the end? So I think if you're spending two full days in a room, you probably need to look at what, <laughs> what you're doing. But I think the what main, main ones I've been involved with have generally been one hour, maybe every other week, you know, and have it as a loose kind of thing. Um, I guess over that time, it means it does take a very long time to, you know, hence why this one's taken a few months. Um, I guess it, you know, how do you know that you've uh, got a good return on investment? I don't, you know, I, I don't know. That's beyond me. <laughs> do, you, do you have any suggestions or um, no? Yeah, I, I think that's the thing. I think for me, it's the return on investment would be, I mean, I would say that phishing emails get answered correctly because even then you've got a good knowledge of cybersecurity that's kind of increased, but are phishing emails even, you know, valuable? That's another question. Um, I think really if you're, if, it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to try and educate developers or, you know, the wider business around what your business threats are, then that is, surely that's a return on investment in itself. Hey Dan, good one. Can we, so threat modeling is extremely complicated and you can take like any threats on a catalog and it can be like infinite time and you can spend not two days but two months to actually come threat model a complex system. So can we reduce the scope of a threat modeling by automating some element of it and maybe unifying some of it with, you know, data management, what kind of data do you have on a system? What kind of vulnerability do you have? And then focusing on actually threat that you can't really model. I mean, I think this is, this is yeah, great, great statement and question. I think this is the thing, like, you've got to start somewhere. I don't think, like, you can bore the ocean ever. And I think a lot of models try and do that. You know, it's like, we want to know all the threats. We want to tick that box on these kind of, uh, you know, all, all this... Um, you know, uh, certificates, and we want to say, yes, we're this, we're Cyber Essentials Plus, well, that's us. Um, and I think, really, if you're kind of doing it as a benefit, you kind of just got to look at what can we do right now? What is the most important thing that we need to know how that works? And normally, it's 
something like an authentication system, maybe. That would probably be the first place, or something that you know, you've got a high data value, your API. And then once you kind of know roughly what's happening there, then maybe then you can expand it out. Um, I think in particular for open source stuff, it's you know, which, which ones would you focus on? Well, the ones that are used the most. Um, but then also through automation, it might mean that you know, if you do have these templates, that then you can, you know, smaller projects, as in, you know, everyone's in the XKDC with the, you know, the one guy in Nebraska, right? And, you know, he's not, you know, he's not going to have, like, a comprehensive threat model. One, he'd be doing it on his own. Secondly, if he could have somebody there, it's incredibly time-consuming. So having something that is like, well, look, this is a rough template. We think that you're probably, your project's being used in this way. Maybe that's better than nothing. And then if someone else has some free time, they can overlook it and go, or, yeah, you're right, or you might be wrong, you know. But then at least then you're opening it to a discussion. Any more questions? Yeah, that's one. Thanks for the talk. Uh, one question is, how would you say, or what would you recommend in terms of the security team not becoming a bottleneck for threat models, especially if you don't have, like, let's say, a few hundred people, but more thousands of people in mm -hmm. a large organization? And would you say, would you, from your experience, from your point of view, is it like mandatory to have threat models, or would you say follow an approach saying every team is developing a new service or a product which is like public access or dealing with PHI information, for example, there's a the policy in place, um, so it needs to conduct a threat modeling exercise with you, or is it more like freedom to the developers to decide? How 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 would you would you say from your I th yeah, great question. I think, so, there's two kind of, well, actually, no, to be honest, you business or open source, in my opinion, I, I think you can't, you can't do something without bringing people on with you. So if you make it mandatory, people don't want to do it, what are you kind of doing? You're just turning people off from, yeah, they won't do it. If you can subtly say, well, here's the benefit of it, the return on investment, you know, that's a better conversation to have. It's like, you don't have to have one, but that might mean that we're going to pick that project that does have all this information over your one. Um, and you might care and you might not care. You know, that's, that's the thing. You made this thing maybe to just help yourself, you know, or help a small group of people. And that's fine. That's fine. But when you're talking that it's used in other places that might want to know that information, then it's there also. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't think mandatory. I, th I think it's. I think that's where personally, some of the legislation might be going a bit wrong. Is saying you must have this because at the end of the day, we we still need open source. We need these projects to be built, and we need to kind of bring these bring everybody on side as opposed to saying that's wrong. Yeah, you know, no, nobody wins an argument by tell, by screaming at somebody they're wrong, right? Cool. Um, any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. That. Thanks. Right, uh, we are going to go into a short break, uh, and uh, just a quick reminder um, for the for the break is that uh, the toilets are at the back at the first door, uh, so don't go too far. And yes, if you would like to have a digital sticker and an NFT, come and see me. We'll be back in ten minutes. Hello. Uh, how are you? Good, good. Um, first question is to have a digital sticker. And yes. The second question is that I have a very
Can everyone please take their seats? We're about to restart. We have the uh, next talk about deep fakes and how to how bad cyber criminals hacking into your bank account using deep fakes. Please take your seats now. Please take your seats, everyone. What's the place we're going? Uh, yes, the, uh, you know, the uh, Zinger Tavern. Zinger Tavern. We've been there. So, Finsbury Square. You can just be six or now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Okay, everyone, we are going to see a talk from a real-life Russian hacker. Everyone is scared of Russian hackers. Have you seen one in real life before? So, Tim Yunusov is a, an ethical Russian hacker, and he's very famous because he's been hacking stuff for a long, long time, and we, you can check back one of his talks from Black Hat 2013, when he was talking about things like PHP session ID hacking XML. and XML, yeah, XML vulnerabilities. But uh, then Tim switched into the uh, payment uh, system hacking and he discovered vulnerabilities in Visa, in MasterCard, in almost every single uh, cash machine, ATM, and uh, manufacturer, in every single little widget that we use to pay contactless these days. And uh, Tim is actually uh, is speaking at Ovas London, London for the third time tonight. First time he presented uh, uh, with Leanne Galloway. They had a talk on how to um, hack an ATM, a cash machine. They had a fantastic talk showing how they actually uh, failed to put an ATM into a Ford Transit van because it literally went through the floor. <laughs> then the second talk was at Revolut where uh, Tim spoke about, uh, again, uh, it was a talk uh, entitled Hack In, Cash Out. Again, how the cyber criminals can steal your money from your bank account. And tonight we have Tim again speaking about synthetic identities or deep fakes and uh, what can be done with them. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, Sam. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, so this presentation is synthetic identities and my upset point of view. My name is Timur Yunusov. Uh, 
I do upsec for a living as opposed to them. Uh, so I was able to, I, I was doing upsec since 2008. I was doing, uh, I was able to somehow hack ATM's point of sales, Visa, MasterCard cards, uh, Google Pay, Apple Pay, just staying within AppSec kind of black box approach. And today, obviously, my talk will be around about the AppSec specialist point of view on synthetic identities, why they are on the rise uh, here in the UK and in the USA. And a lot of people might disagree with, with my point of view. Yeah, like compliant officers will, will think differently. They will say, hey, this is this is not correct. But I think that's that's the whole point of this talk today, to be on the same page, to talk the same language. And uh, I really think that, I really hope that you all find something interesting in, in that, uh, in my today's talk. So exactly as Sam said, Back in 2019, OWASP, London meetup, uh, Revolut office, I'm showing how to hack banking apps. 2023, OWASP meetup, one's office, I'm showing how to hack banking apps. <laughs> Not much has changed, right? Uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm really, I really enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah, but... Uh, my results that in the last few years, in the last seven years, you know, since I switched to like uh, hacking uh, payment systems, all I got is just a bunch of angry vendors, a uh, bunch of customers that don't know how to fix or don't want to fix uh, things I report to them. And normally what I report is things related to money somehow, yeah, and uh, these problems are not even in top three priorities these days because the priorities for, for most of organizations will be extortion, ransomware, open AWS buckets, yeah, so uh, they, they mostly don't understand me and I realized... Uh, like a few years ago, that I need to step up and start talking the same language with the companies I address the problems to. Yeah, so uh, today I'm going to show you my results along this uh, path of trying to talk the same language with the banks. So what I mean by talking the same language, well, first of all, obviously, as I said, vulnerabilities are everywhere. We have this vulnerabilities fatigue. Uh, no one cares about them these days. And basically what we need is we need to switch somehow from talking about like bugs, exploits, attacks to uh, more business level of like risks, threats. And if you are talking about banks, in my specific case, obviously uh, fraud. Yeah, and I was doing some kind of training workshops uh, that's called Bug Bounty in Payments for hackers, uh, telling them exactly the same thing, how to deliver uh, your findings and leverage your findings to the banks, to fintech for them to understand you. So I think that's a good time for a disclaimer. Yeah, opinions are my own. Not represent, do not represent or express uh, views of my employer, who mostly doesn't even know <laughs> my opinions on, on, on these topics. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, three types of organizations. Yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And my ground rules are now, these days, I'm trying to ignore uh, bad and ugly who are not receptive, who don't listen to what, what, what I'm trying to say, and work mostly with the good, because there are plenty of them. And for the bad and the ugly, I, I don't actually have any problems with sharing findings that I reported to them and that they, they were later ignored, because ultimately, uh, it's like with zero days. Yeah, if zero days is actively exploited, uh, there is no problem for companies like Google Project Zero to publish more technical details about them for for the great good, yeah, for the great good of the much broader uh, audience. 
But I still would like to say that it's quite an imperative not trying to violate the law. Try not to violate the law for whilst whatever you do. Uh, and even if you actually try not to violate the law actively, it still somehow can slip and backfire. And I'm going to show you today uh, how this happens from, from time to time. So the good, the bad, and the ugly, not specifically in that order. Uh, when, when I moved uh, to the UK, uh, I opened something around 30 different fintech uh, apps, applications, accounts, uh, just to see what's there on the market. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> some of them at times had bug bounty. Some of them proved that there's no point of trying to interact with them. But I think exactly 2019 of us London, I was sharing the story about uh, Curve, a startup, that, and then my research called uh, How to Lose Money D During Payment Research. And they were quite bad at times. So raise a hand who knows Curve or who has a card of them. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's quite good, yeah. You have it just because I asked you to open it for me. It's really, really nice card. Amazing startup. I'm, 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 a, big, uh, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I don't have any beef with them, although I talk about them recently very often. It's probably too much, need to stop. Uh, so for, for, for people who don't have a uh, curve, the, the main idea is that you order a card, you add a bunch of your other cards to that card, and you choose from the mobile app which card to use for the next payment. And works great. Yeah, well, now they allow you to, to have only two cards attached uh, within the free free account, but still. Yeah, so that was amazing, amazing startup. I started using it a lot. And uh, after that presentation in 2019, they announced Bug Bounty, which lasted for six months. Uh, <laughs> Send a lot of things there. Uh, even, even I think I even got some money from there. But nevertheless, yeah, so, and, and that was just only the first sign of a really messy uh, InfoSec approach. So they had a constant rotation of the security staff. I've seen three CISO since then in, in, in their team. And I don't even have time to get hold of them. Yeah, by the time I, I send uh, some, something to them, they, they already have different teams. But I still try, honestly, yeah, so last reports I sent them was, I think, November. Uh, another thing that I have noticed, uh, there was an article in 2019 in Business Insider that claimed that uh, only 15% of Curve accounts uh, were, were ever used the Curve card, yeah, which was quite bad for, for their image. So what happened? is a week after that announcement, I got a notification in my Curve app saying, spend five pounds within the next month and we will send you back your five pounds or, or, or a tenner, I don't remember. I was like, wow, that's that's a move, guys. That's, that's a really move. Uh, and after that, they decided to collab with Samsung Pay. Who uses Samsung Pay? Raise a hand. <laughs> yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, that's 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 the that's the problem with Samsung Pay. Yeah, the the thing with wallet is that uh, if if you want your wallet like Apple Pay or Google Pay to work with your card, so your card can be added to this wallet, you need to have a that your bank will have an agreement with that particular vendor, and not many banks really wanted to have agreements with Samsung for some reason. They were thinking, okay, we have plenty, we have Apple and, and, and Google uh, white water. And uh, they struggled for quite a while, and they decided, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do a, a nice move. We're gonna make a contract with Curve, and every card you try to add to Samsung Pay, if, this, you, if your bank does not support Samsung Pay, we will automatically enroll a Curve card, add your card to the Curve account, and here you go. You have a Samsung Pay, working Samsung Pay. Uh, that's, that's quite good, brilliant idea. Uh, 
but along this process, they completely wiped out the uh, formal QIC, know your customer, yeah, so uh, you don't need to send proof of address, proof of identity, any documents in that form whatsoever. So what you need is just center your first, last name, address, and the date of birth, and you will either get a, a approved uh, and already issued virtual card or, or not, if, if uh, some database information doesn't match. And uh, they call it a progressive QIC. And progressive QIC means that this can work only until you will spend your first 100 or 200 pounds. Uh, but obviously, if you can get a hold of hundreds, thousands of, of uh, accounts, first name, last name, date of birth, uh, address, uh, there is no limit of 100. You can issue as many virtual cards as you want. These days, they allow you not even to send the physical plastic to the original address, which is very handy. Uh, and yes, yeah, so ultimately, it's it's a really bad, shady practice, I would say. But 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 guys think that well, you know, it's not not a big problem. We're still within the uh, compliance uh, requirements, so. What's the problem? Yeah, and, and, and I was able just to find all of these things and, and more just because I asked myself a question. How do I simulate fraud in, in that specific organization? Yeah, because I really wanted to talk the same language with the bank. So I was never able to talk with them the same language. They just fixed some vulnerabilities. Some of them are still uh, working, and I just moved on. Uh, moved on to the idea of uh, anti-fraud threat team in exercises. Yeah, so as many people are here, as many uh, ideas of what threat team stands for, I think there is. But for me, uh, red team, especially anti-fraud threat team, is uh, and the main difference between like Pentas or product security is we see this this financial organization and we break down to the ideas of like how exactly criminals can steal money from their organization and bypass their anti-fraud rules. Uh, and which is more important is that what bank have to do to stop this happening. Because if I can take a knife, go to CEO and just force him to send money to me, well, not much you can do. Uh, from the security standpoint against this threat, yeah. Uh, and so the whole idea for me was just like stop talking in, in terms of XSS and SQL injections, yeah, and, and drone headers and start talking about like threats, attacks uh, related to money laundering. So, uh, but because we are talking about threats, like the first step would be threat intelligence. So I went to dark web, start looking at what uh, people are up to these days, criminals, what they do, uh, how they steal money uh, from, from banks. And at the times, I did not know that actually the UK, one of the worst regions in terms of uh, QIC compliance. Yeah, so uh, if you will have like one big European bank or fintech, uh, you will find on the dark web only offerings around the U about the UK. You won't find that they will open you a fake accounts or like uh, uh, saving accounts in Germany, for example. Yeah, it's it's really something to do with, with compliance and and like these uh, checks that are in place in in different regions. But yeah, that's that's the case. UK, in that sense, across Europe, is the worst. So. Uh, yeah, so I, I had a look what's going on, what, what banks are on the market, which apps I have, which security guys I know to reach out to them and start talking to them like, hey, do you, do you want this, do you want that? Uh, but uh, also want to say that the same things actually happens with uh, business accounts. Yeah, so three weeks ago, I was able to open a business account in one of the biggest payment processors in Europe. 
and I can take payments, receive payments to my bank details and don't even know that I'm not even allowed to have a business entity in this country due to my visa uh, limitations. Yeah, not only I don't have this business account, obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is how messy things are uh, in, in some of the European countries. And, and I really like this guy, uh, Graham Barrow. He writes about uh, companies house, UK companies house mess constantly. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. Yeah, like Chris Elliott Zuckerberg, the guy who was born in 2002, opened and established in October uh, 2022 two organizations since Inst Instagram Limited and uh, Meta Platforms uh, Limited. And, 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 and he sends, he just posts these things day by day, every day. Amazing guy. Yeah, like Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. I highly recommend you. So uh, once I settled with with the customer find out the customer who really uh is keen and interest and interested in in what i'm doing uh we sit and said okay w what are we gonna do and the first like natural idea was okay shall we buy this service from some guys of uh dark market these fake documents or fake accounts and see how they do this, yeah, go, go through the process backwards or like do some shadowing or something. But it turned out that it's a dodgy practice and you can very easily get into prison just for that because of financing terrorism, because you, you never know where the money is sent, yeah, because you sent in crypto. Uh, so not not a good idea. Uh, and, and instead of that, I was like, well, okay, I have to... Uh, unwrap my Photoshop account, yeah, just use a little bit of imagination and see what to do, what I can do myself instead of buying some of ready uh, services of, of dark web. Uh, and by that time, I already realized that it will be quite useful to have some insights and I decided, okay, I also need to open a QIC uh, I, need, I need to open an account in one of existing QIC vendors just to see what's happening in the background because even with uh, the bank you completely agreed upon all the further works, you probably will have one or two attempts tops, yeah, because after that your, your account, your real documents will, will be banned, so yeah, that's not good. Uh, that was quite easy, I opened the account in one of QIC vendors, service providers, demo account, uh, and because I am quite flexible in terms of I don't want to create a fake account for John Doe, yeah, I just wiped out a few letters from my first name and last name and I became Timu Yunus. Uh, which is still a fake, fake person, yeah, who never existed, never had a national insurance number, nothing. Uh, and yeah, I was really able to get away with this thing. So I uploaded the documents, all the checks went through, and I was like, okay, that's quite promising. That means that I probably will be able to open uh, an account with the bank. We agreed I will be able to open it. Yeah, but but the last problem is that here, obviously, I uploaded documents in uh, JPEG, where in the app, you need to take a photo, yeah, technically. Uh, so you, you, you have two cases. Normally, we are talking about like desktop apps and, and mobile apps. And desktop apps, quite easy. You have a bunch of software, even free software, that's called uh, virtual cameras. Yeah, a lot of companies try to fight with that, but ultimately, yeah, that's that's always loose. Yeah, whenever you try to check liveness on Windows or Mac, it's it's uh, there is no chance you can prove that this is exactly a live person who recorded something just in front of you a minute ago. Uh, we had company who were checking names of the webcams on the system and were like had their black lace. So what we've done, we just renamed the camera to integrated camera instead of like other brand camera. And and, and that was it, the, the, the check passed. I was like, wow, 
that's that's bold. Uh, so obviously, desktop is is out of game uh, because and, and and obviously in most of apps you have the situation where if you are trying to submit uh, using desktop, you will you will be mostly likely sent to use the mobile app. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, is obviously the quality of the camera because in 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 mobile phones these days cameras are much much better than uh, webcams. Uh, but the second is, yeah, you have slightly higher entry barriers to tamper data on uh, Android or iOS. And it's called, it's something to do with device attestation. So if you have proper device attestation uh, on the app, if you do not allow it to be run on jailbroken or rooted device, you have much higher chance for... Uh, to be sure that the data that comes from the camera is actually uh, the original data from the camera instead of this uh, Photoshop document. Uh, next step for criminals would be to actually create actual physical plastic. Yeah, they use uh, some very uh, well famous uh, printer brands for that, but. I didn't have money for that, yeah, so I, I I was trying to find the app that will allow me to upload my forged document. So I found that, that was nice, everything went smoothly, I got money for the project, and then I got a message that I got banned from uh, six banks at the same time. I was like, what is going on? So it turned out that... Uh, we had the agreement with the bank, yeah, that was good. Bank knew what I was doing, but they just forgot to mention that to the QIC vendor, uh, that uh, they were doing these red team exercises. And uh, because I was sending uh, real documents and fake documents, uh, this QIC vendor was quite vigilant and they added my real documents, my real driver, driving license in, in their blacklist and it's still he, there these days. So whenever I, I open a banking app, I always have a chance that your banking app is open and a minute after we get a notification. Unfortunately, we do not want to have anything to do with you. Goodbye. Uh, yeah, so after that, kind of kick in the guts, I decided to have some some break from from uh, opening, de dealing with fake uh, identities and uh, yeah, just had half a year, year of break, not having anything to do with them. And at the times I was working with a quite talented uh, group of uh, data scientists. Yeah, they were not hackers, they were like, proper ML AI experts, and we had our security AppSec expertise on top of them, trying to navigate them and help them uh, doing some cool things, some cool research. So I really kept a very close eye uh, on everything related to deepfakes. And suddenly I got this uh, uh, ad saying, hey, this is amazing defensive, uh, deepfake offensive toolkit that creates uh, deepfake live with your face and allows you to bypass, bypass liveness checks. Uh, only now I realize that there is like absolutely nothing, uh, they don't say anything about like how they actually implement this, like I I implementing, in, in, in invading the pipeline, especially on the mobile app. But nevertheless, I was like, okay, it's quite interesting. Let's have it, uh, let's give it a go and try to, uh, do something similar, yeah. And even these days, it happens exactly the same. So this is an ad of uh, like one week ago, uh, where the guy is saying, "Hey, this is things that we offer. We can uh, we can create deepfakes in 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 real time. Yeah, it's quite good." Uh, have you noticed the problems with these videos? Yeah, they both have. An appalling quality, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, unfortunately, deep fakes, uh, real-time deep fakes, are not as sophisticated and as good as people uh, post them, and that's what I realized during my last attempt. Yeah, so I found an app that allowed me to send as many requests to them as possible in order to create a video deep fake of supposedly not not me 
Yeah, so the, the first thing I realized by that time already that I need to choose a person whose phenotype is very close to my own, like facial features. Yeah, if I will choose a, a fat blonde guy, it's, it, it's not gonna work. Uh, you, you don't need to be genius to, to realize that. Uh, second is, well, because I was working for my previous employer and I had some kind of budgets, I was able to use not only open source tools, but some commercial products. So I paid for Google Collab Pro for months, which was really helpful. Uh, bought a few other commercial products uh, instead of using trials. Yeah, and, uh, but again, the, the whole idea, it all comes to finding an app that would allow me to send hundreds of these video requests to the systems and hundreds is like the minimum amount. If you're talking about like manual uh, verifications made by humans, if you're talking about uh, systems that are made with AI, you are talking something about like thousands of hundreds of thousands of requests you will need to send to be able to, to bypass these things. And uh, yeah, so Deepfake Offensive Toolkit, nice thing. Uh, from 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 the demo didn't work very well. So this how these toolkits thinks uh, our offspring would have looked. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Bank does not think that this is me. So again, what I was doing, yeah, I'm taking the video from this guy, uh, taking my photo and try to create video that looks much closer to myself and send it. Uh, to verify my own account. Uh, so yes, he still does not look like me at all. Uh, and again, yes, yeah, so facial features are quite important. These people look even worse. This is the guy, <laughs> the same t-shirt. Uh, this guy, well, also, as you can see, so, so this is already a product of deep fake. So this guy supposedly have my face on top of his, but he still looks more like him rather than me. Uh, so I took a step back and I was like, okay, uh, let's try to take my own fake video, my own video, put my own face on top of that just to see, maybe I will be blocked by that time. Maybe system somehow recognize deep fakes or s something like that. Yeah. So I created these two things. Uh, well, y you can see this definitely looks like an edited video. Uh, on the second one, you also have some kind of artifacts, but these went through, they both were accepted. I was like, wow, that's, that's good. Okay, uh, coming back to creating deepfakes from, from this guy, uh, started using how it's called Deepface Lab, uh, amazing toolkit, really kind of like resource-wise expensive, uh, so I had to use uh, Google App Pro for that. Uh, and also by that time I realized that uh, small things are very important, like do you wear a glass, do you, do, do you wear glasses, do you not wear glasses, yeah, what kind of glasses, what kind of background you have. And because I had this flexibility, I was asking to the guy, hey, can you record the video uh, like with the white background, uh, take your glasses off, I'll put my glasses on top of that. Uh, so a couple tries, uh, this... Mm, you see, not 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 the best quality. This this one this one was was the best product of mine, and it still failed. Unfortunately, uh, and then after a few more weeks, uh, I came to some genius ideas. Uh, so I took I took my own photo, created a video from a photo, and then started to work on improving quality. Of that uh, of that video, so these last two products uh, actually were good enough to bypass verification in that bank. Uh, yeah, so that was quite good. Uh, it took me about a week or two, and then I decided to look at audio as well. Uh, I'm not sure will this audio work or not. No, okay. Well, that's just basically a very artificial robotic uh, audio at the background that obviously is not lip sync at all. 
and I sent it to the bank and the verification still went through. Uh, and you may know that just a few days ago, uh, Joseph Cox from Motherboard Wise published how they use uh, deepfakes to actually get access to uh, voice banking, which is, for example, widely used by HSBC. So my idea also was like a few weeks ago, let's let's try and do it. Uh, but this guy just got for us, so I, I I don't see any points of of doing that. So, but 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 yeah, it's it's absolutely feasible, absolutely possible to create deepfake from half an hour of my conversation here uh, that's on YouTube now and uh, get access to <clears throat> to my uh, banking account if, if the bank supports uh, voice verification. So how many people of you just have this question on the background? What has it anything to do with an app? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, you probably don't listen at all. Uh, so if 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 you will uh, start from from the latest example yeah from the latter example uh timing attacks yeah so timing attacks as you should know it's where an attacker can gather some information based on how long it take for server to handle your request yeah and basically it's quite similar to the cryptographic timing attack where the same uh, information can be used to to uh, guess brute force uh, uh, and break break the cryptography. So this is exactly what I was doing in my latest example. I uh, determined that the system uh, was verifying uh, videos manually, so some people had to verify these videos manually because on the weekends. It took much longer to get response than on a normal day. And I was like, okay, that pro basically means that if it's verified by humans, I can send the same video again and again and again, and eventually I will be accepted. Yeah, and then I just got unlucky for a couple of times. Uh, I, I, if you talk about like much broader things, obviously device attestation. Device attestation is crucial. Yeah, in all three of these applications, everything started with me using rooted device launching these apps. If they would not be launched on rooted device, I won't be able to get so far um, or it would take me much, much longer energy and effort to get it done. Uh, trial and error, yeah, brute force, or I call it trial and error. Basically, again, if I would not be able to send hundreds of, well, I probably did like 50 to be fair, yeah, uh, this 50 requests to the bank, uh, if I would be banned from the first time and they would say, hey, we actually need to reach out to you and talk to you in person in order to unlock your account, I would not be able to, to get a success in, in, in the latest attack. Uh, information leakage, which is quite a familiar concept. Yeah, if I'm able to get access to these demo accounts of QIC vendors, I'm able to understand how they work, how they operate, what checks they do, what checks they don't do, and, and prepare uh, my attack. And uh, finally, replay. A lot of banks ask you to add random numbers, current date or digits at the end of your video or audio recording. Why is that? Uh, well, the whole idea is that no one can actually take your video, sorry, no one can actually take your video and then reuse it to get access to the mobile app like a week ago or two weeks ago, and this is fine. Uh, this is kind of protection against the replay attack, but at the same time, if the uh, pin that you need to, the, if these random digits you need to uh, say at the end would be valid for only five or 10 minutes, that would mean that I would not be able to create deepfake of 15 seconds or like even these three seconds where I uh, spell these digits in that time that I've been given. Yeah, because resources, I need much more resources to, resources to get it done. And no one was actually checking these things. So I, it's just basically the, last, the latest video. The latest video will require you to pronounce these six digits, which is, which is quite odd. Uh, and again, if you'll break it down to quite familiar to 
I, I hope most of you, uh, all of us top 10 thinks, yeah, we are talking about like broken access control, insecure design, uh, identification failures. Yeah, so all these things have something to do with AppSec. Well, it's just because I'm an AppSec guy. Yeah, and everything looks like an L for me. Uh, but really at the end, what I would like to say today is we can and we should do better. Yeah, so uh, for, for companies, for vendors, I think it's really good to try start doing these red team exercises, focusing on your actual risk and threats instead of bugs, vulnerabilities and expecting uh, reports from uh, bug bounty uh, companies. Yeah, talking about the bug bounty, yeah, do not launch bug bounty if you're not ready, guys. That's that's a wrong, wrong thing to do. Uh, these guys were overwhelmed and uh, shut down six months later, and they were not the one. Uh, I've seen three, four banks that have done exactly, well, not banks, fintech or neobanks. They have done exactly the same problem. Yeah, they, they were like, oh, how do we deal with these 10,000 requests about uh, XSS, self-XSS? Uh, and uh, yeah, application security is vital, uh, not only because uh, it applies to the same concepts across different domains, but also because if all you guys have as a FinTech is a mobile app, is if everything else is in cloud outsourced and whatnot, you need to invest into your app. Yeah, you need to invest in security of your only major product. Uh, and, and for hackers, myself as well, yeah, we we definitely can do better in terms of delivering the findings uh, to the companies, to the affected uh, instances. Yeah, because even this presentation can be done much better, but we got what we've got, what we deserve as an industry. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much for an amazing uh, talk, Timur. So uh, we already have one question online, which I'm going to ask, because obviously you talked about um, getting your uh, uh, identity documents and know your customer KYC um, um, blacklisted, right? But someone was asking, OK, that's just the identity bit, right? So you, you managed to get on the blacklist. But did this actually affect your credit rating in the UK? No. No, uh, so credit rating is obviously a different story, but if, if again, this, the, the same problem is that we have five, six, well, these days maybe slightly more uh, QIC vendors, yeah, and we also have two, three credit bureaus, which is even worse. So whenever you got into this blacklist, everyone that uses that particular organization will have a faction on you, yeah, so. God bless, I already had my mortgage in place, yeah. But if by now I would decide to open an account in Bank X, yeah, that, that, that might be a problem. But actually, no, well, the answer is no. Credit rating was not affected. Thanks, okay, Fortunately. so one question here already. There you go, Francesca. So great talk. You have access to your face and to your recording, but how can this be scaled by having access to maybe somebody else's video and try to hijack somebody else's face or voice? And what's your opinion on it? Well, again, I started with the idea closest to real attack scenario. I took my photo, high res, which is quite easy. I can get a high photo, a high res photo of you. Yeah, not a problem. And I created an animated video from that photo. And on top of that, I started tweaking with, with the quality, yeah. So all I need is uh, have a photo of you. Yeah, if you are talking about audio deepfakes, you need something around 10 to 15 minutes of a conversation. And as a public speaker, I'm uh, yeah in, 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 in a list of uh, potential uh, victims, yeah. Okay, more questions? Then, Absolutely fantastic talk, I'm blown away by it. But in particular, can you see 
any kind of market for kind of fraud or you know actual fraud organization or anti-fraud organizations kind of using this on an automated level to try and stop exactly that they see you know, ask you know in the same way they ask for your email addresses these days or you know who lives in your house to kind of protect against those things do you could you see you know them asking for your video so they store that and compare it against uh, various uh, things or is that just too complex to try well all these days all, all they are about is ai yeah uh, and to the point where visa mastercard and like big vendors like feature space which i really adore nice anti-fraud startup they try to apply ai in areas where solutions is like if then else yeah, if there is a strict rule you put in place, things done. Instead of that, I'm like, yeah, let's learn how, how we actually can behave and should behave. Yeah, so I think your idea of like implementing these uh, red team activities uh, at a large scale within anti fraud teams is very infeasible at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, there was another question online somewhere about the data. Was it resonating with Mike's first talk about the data? Was it by submitting KYC information? That's a lot of data you showed in them. Driving license, videos, right? Um, and the thing is, uh, the question was, do companies actually store this data for longer than they need? And do they then actually reuse this data? So in any of your research, do you think that any of your successful attempts were actually based on the fact that you had some unsuccessful attempts before and they previously had your data and gradually build up that gradual KYC? Um, do you, any, well, is, well, is the previous storage it, of data exactly, exactly, had? Exactly, the, with the latest case, just the latest case shown that no data, well, it might be stored, but it was not used, yeah, because that would, Ob that would be obvious that, uh, well, in, in the second video, yeah, I suddenly start talking absolutely different voice. Yeah, like that, that should be a red flag. Uh, and, and all these videos that I was able to send in, in, in a bank in, in the latest example also shows that none of these videos were available to the person who checked my video at the moment. I don't know what about the actual storage of them, uh, but that's uh, also interesting question from the point is when I was posting one of my articles, which are on paymentwillage.org, uh, I was reached out by one of the biggest banks, like a compliance officer, who uh, made a beef about like, hey, you say that we, all, all the banks and, and, and fintech just outsource QIC they don't do things in-house, well, which is mostly the case. We do QIC in-house, yeah? And, and I think that's the problem, that w when you do QIC in-house, you are liable for storing personal data and whatnot. So most of banks will prefer to just outsource these things and don't have anything to do with these, with these things. Uh, but if you have resources, energy, and in, in enough uh, procedures in place, you can store them safely. Yeah, it's not a, not a problem, but no one actually uses them. That's that's the point. Okay. Any? Oh, yeah. There's one question here. <laughs> hey, mate. Amazing presentation. Seriously. Um, how do you know you're not crossing the legality boundaries during your activity? And um, are you not? Are you scared about legal impacts, legality impacts? I actually do know that I cross in boundaries. I cross boundaries day by day, uh, every day. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my job. I'm, I'm, I'm a white hacker, yeah? Uh, I think of that, uh, who is the victim? There is a victimless crime, yeah? I'm trying to prove a point. Uh, that's, that's, that's the problem number one. Uh, Problem number two, well, I mean, yeah, uh, so sometimes I go on a very thin ice and I see the the outcome of that. Yeah, the repercussions uh, might be much, much worse. So, so far I was able to get away with these things. And my life's approach is if I was able to get away with these things in the past, I'm, I'm, I can keep doing these things. But yeah, I, I don't try to embrace anyone 
in this room to keep doing <laughs> what I do. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's a dodgy question. I ask this myself every day. Yeah, just to add, we did have a talk about the Computer uh, Misuse Act, and I think it's actually changing. So there are actually some changes coming up. So for responsible vulnerability disclosure, there's now hopefully going to be better guidelines and better legal protections. Uh, any more questions? No? OK. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Sim. <laughs>